Praise God. Good morning. Happy Sunday, everybody. My name is Joey Geisel. If I haven't gotten to meet you yet, I get to be the pastor of young adults in prayer ministry here at Grace, and Pastor Gary asked me to fill in for him while he's away on sabbatical for this week. So uh, before I even talk about the word, can we pray together? Would you pray with me real quick? Father God, in the name of Jesus, I bless this gathering of Grace Community Church and all of our visitors, everybody online. Abba, would you give us a spirit of wisdom and a revelation of the knowledge of you, Lord? I ask that everybody who hears my voice would come to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. And you do it through your word, your spirit, and the connection of your body. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, happy Sunday. There's, there is this guy, um, and his name is Gary. And he's been leading us through a series on wisdom, like this entire year. Can y'all believe it's been since January 3rd? I went back and looked at the pastoral calendar. Anybody else feel more wise? I should be more wise. It's been a good series, but um, I just was excited in the middle of spring when he asked me to, to come fill in for him here on July 18th, and just continually, I knew pretty quickly what the Lord wanted to say, uh, which was really helpful for me, and uh, just the last four weeks, I just want us to think through what we've been through together in the Word in the last four Sundays, okay? If you've been here, or if you missed some, whatever. So four weeks ago, Father's Day, right, Gary's up on stage, and he's saying, I want to finish up my wisdom series, we've been doing lots of Proverbs, but I want to close with Job and Ecclesiastes, and my only thought sitting in the, 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 out there with you is, as a young father with an almost two-year-old was, please, Gary, don't preach on Job on Father's Day. That was my only reaction to, please, he didn't. He very wisely, I just imagine, please, how are you going to tie that to Father's Day? Please don't tie Job to Father's Day. Um, but he preached on Job, and then he preached on Ecclesiastes on Father's Day instead. So it's, everything is meaningless, right? And he did a really good job. <laughs> I'm just saying, he did a really good job, the most balanced interpretation and most friendly interpretation of Ecclesiastes I've ever heard. But it was still Ecclesiastes, everything is meaningless, cynical teacher. And then he taught on Job, the ultimate case of suffering. And then Jerry's message, message on July 4th was super refreshing. And then last week, Jonathan spoke on hell. I realized I'm set. Whatever I want to talk about, you guys are going to be so grateful for it's not even going to matter. It's, it was just so refreshing for me. I'm totally set. So I'd like to spend the next 30 minutes talking about the plague of boils from 1 Samuel 5. Uh, so turn with me to 1 Samuel 5, please. No, we're not going to do that. But uh, praise God. I want to talk about one of my favorite verses, Proverbs 4, 23. It's been kind of a life verse for me as a big brother heart and a, now a dad and husband heart. Um, so I just want to look at that first. Let's read that verse together on the screens. Proverbs 4, 23, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And we can see the verse itself kind of answers the question, why should we study this verse? Right? It says, above all else, above everything else that you do, guard your heart. And I, I went to the Hebrew, I went to the original language, I looked up that word all. And you know what that word all said? It means all. Okay, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So there's a scriptural priority to this verse that it just kind of sneaks up on you. It's kind of there toward the end of Proverbs 4, right? You can just be reading along, la, 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 and then above everything else you do, do that, what? You know, you can kind of hit the brakes and why does it say this? Why does it emphasize this so much? So let's look at the definition of heart. If we're going to guard our heart, I want to get a good definition going. So Strong's definitions says, heart is the feelings, the will, and even the intellect. Okay, so it's, it's your, your emotions, your will to choose things, and your ability to think. That's your heart. It's all encapsulated there. Sometimes, you know, the word soul covers some of the same territory. But above all else, guard your heart. It means guard your will, your choices, guard your, your intellect, your, your thoughts, and guard everything else about you, the will, the intellect, the emotions. So above all else, guard your heart. There's a priority there. And I just want to look at why. I want to look at a couple more English translations of this verse. I find it helpful sometimes to look at various English translations because sometimes the Hebrew has multi, multi facets. So let's look at NASB. We like to preach from here a lot. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. And then NLT, New Living Translation, one of my favorites to, to speak out loud and to read in public. Next, guard your heart 
above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Okay, you can see how your mind, your will, and your emotions can determine the course of your life, and that's why God is so vehement about us guarding our heart, that internal place of ourselves, the, the, the intimacy of our soul. Okay, so I want to talk about, even before we look into the word heart, we look into the word guard, I want to go back to that and see where else it's mentioned in Scripture so we can get a context, but I believe that at least my generation got this verse way wrong. Okay, almost always, especially, and where, are my, where are my millennials at? Anybody born 1981 to 1996? Come on, my, my people! Okay, excellent. Most of you are not raising your hands. I know you. Most of you are not raising your hands. Okay, so we had very few here first service, but they got extra treasure in heaven, just so you know. Um, <laughs> praise God. So I think the millennials got it wrong. Gen Z, y'all getting it better? Anybody Gen Z born after 1996? There were four of them here first service, and they're just not raising their hands. I need to get to know you guys better. It's okay. Um, so I think our generations have gotten this wrong. To guard your heart, most of the time I've seen this employed exclusively in the realm of romantic relationships. Most of the time, I've seen, it's literally like become like a meme, like, guard your heart, bro. You know, it's like ex exclusively in that context of guys and girls figuring things out, doing things romantically. Guard your heart. But most of the time, I've really, really seen it played out as an excuse for self-protection. I've almost exclusively seen, probably 99%, I don't think I've ever seen this verse used within context for anything but self-protection in the context of relationships with, between men and women. Okay, and I, most of the time it's guard your heart, bro. Don't don't invest too much. She might betray you. Guard your heart, girl. He might he might turn on you like the last one, or he might not be worth it. He might not be the one. So don't love too hard. Don't sacrifice too much. Don't invest too much. Don't give too much of yourself because the fear of loss. I believe most of us read this as self protection. Okay, but I want to look at some of the words and where these words are used in scripture and get some better context of what I believe is the intention of this verse is to guard your heart, is to press in to the Lord who is your guardian. Okay, I believe that's the proper way to interpret this. We're going to look at that. But first, I thought of a pop culture analogy for how I really believe my generation does this, okay? Anybody heard of Fruit Ninja? <laughs> Familiar with Fruit Ninja? Some of you? Okay, it's a video game, right? And large fruit are thrown at your face in the video game. Large, large chunks of watermelons, cantaloupes, you know, bunches of bananas, right? And you have a sword, and you stand there, and your job playing Fruit Ninja is to cut the, you know, cut the fruit in certain directions or whatever before it smacks you in the face. Okay, that's the point of Fruit Ninja. And I personally believe that my generation applies Proverbs 4.23 like they're playing a game of Fruit Ninja. And so to visualize this, we have a video, um, and I'm going to narrate what I believe to be the inner dialogue of most people in male-female relationships when they are trying to apply Proverbs 4.23 to guard their hearts. Let's watch this. Chosen one, guardian of the forest, trained to protect against the enemy. Anybody, anybody live that way? Anybody tried to guard your heart like getting pieces of fruit thrown at you and you're just trying to slap it down or cut it? I really, really believe my generation's got this wrong. I was single for 30 years and I know I lived like that a lot. Whoa, whoa, ha, he, you know, it's, it's, you don't have to be a ninja. You have to press into the God who is the guardian of your heart. That's my, that's my thesis behind this today is to guard your heart 
is to press yourself into the God who sets himself up to be the guardian of your heart. So let's look at some verses. We're going to look at some places where that word heart is used, the same exact word in the Hebrew, and to see what context is this word used in scripturally. Okay, I want to start with Psalm 7, verse 10. It says, My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. Psalm 7, 10. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. It presents God like as a shield. It's like his characteristic. That's his personally assigned job description is to be your shield. And if you're in Jesus, you have the uprightness in heart that Jesus transforms you into. Okay, so in Jesus, he is your shield and you are the upright in heart. You get that. Psalm 27, verses one and three, one of my favorites for a long time. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When a host can camp against me, my heart will not fear. The war arise against me. In spite of this, I shall be confident. Okay, you see the context of where our heart is supposed to be? It's not though a host arise against me, I shall defend myself from all of them. Though a host arise against me, the Lord is my light and my salvation. So I'm, I'm just making this case that the scripture presents God as the one we run to, God as the one who has tasked himself with being the guardian of our hearts. Psalm 28, verse seven. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. Therefore my heart, same word twice in the same verse, therefore my heart exults and with my song I shall thank him. So where is your heart? This morning, what do you do whenever you're feeling attacked or possibly attacked or you're feeling needy or possibly have needs that you can't meet on your own, right? Are you just going into self-defense mode emotionally or do we figure out as followers of Jesus how to press our heart into the God who is the guardian of our hearts? And as we talk about guarding our hearts, I know a lot of us in the room might just say that ship has sailed. My heart's already... My heart's already lost or broken or been taken from me. Some of us have just gone through trauma or loss, either because of the consequences of our own actions and our own sins. Let's be real. I'm at the first of that line. Or you've had your heart broken or you've lost things at the hand of someone else. It happens. So you're sitting there thinking, what do I do? How do I guard my heart when it's already, it's already lost or been taken from me? I just want to speak the word of the Lord over you this morning that God is especially close to the brokenhearted. He offers special. I know some of your stories. Special intimacy to those that have been stolen from and those that have lived through the consequences of their own sinful actions but are now repentant and trying to recover the pieces of your life. Let's look at the word that backs it up. Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. So I just want to speak the word of the Lord. If you are brokenhearted today, first I'm sorry, but the Lord is near to you. He is committed to draw near to you as you draw near to him, and you're in a good place to draw near to him today by being in this room or being online. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. May you find his nearness today and in this season in Jesus' name. And one more verse on the heart. This is incredibly close to, close to me. This verse got me out of severe depression at the beginning of 2011. Lamentations 3. This I recall to my mind, frequently translated heart, but same Hebrew word. This I recall to my mind. Therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease. For his compassions never fail you're struggling from hope, if you're struggling for hope because of a broken heart or loss or trauma or whatever you're going through right now, this you recall to your mind, to your heart. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease for his compassions never fail. May the Lord strengthen you in this. May these words be comfort to you. I can feel it in the room. Some of you are struggling. May the Lord minister to you 
by the power of the Holy Spirit, may you see these words come true in your life as you make your way to heaven because he's been faithful to me. So that's verses on the heart. Let's get back to our, our original verse here, Proverbs 4.23. Why are we studying this? Because God says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Above all else. So let's look at guard. We looked at places where the word uses heart in there. Let's look at what it means to guard. Where are the contexts for that same word to be guarded or to be kept? And I want to see this again over the room because I know some of you, and I know some of your stories, and those of you that I don't know, I can guess. Some of you don't feel guarded by the Lord. Some of you don't feel guarded if you're just like, let me be real honest and take off my church face. I don't feel like the Lord's been doing a good job guarding me. And I've been, I've been there, y'all. I haven't walked this perfectly. But we've got to elevate the word of God over our experiences. You've got to do it. It's the only way. It's the only way to stay sane. The Lord is so tender towards you guys. This didn't happen for service, y'all. It was early. They had their act together. Most of us got here late. <laughs> no, the Lord is so tender to you guys. I just really sense his pleasure over the room. He is so fond of you. May you know this. So you need to know. Elevate the word of God over your experiences, places where you haven't felt guarded, places where you have been stolen from, and we can acknowledge, yeah, man, I lost it there, and I haven't seen it back on earth. Elevate the word of God. When's the first place that this word guard is used in scripture? It's in declaring the name of God. Let's go. First reference, Exodus 34, verses five through seven. The Lord descended in a cloud and stood there with Moses as he called upon the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps or guards loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Put that above your experience. Put that above your loss. The second time the word uses this same word for guard, Deuteronomy 32.10, it's talking about God's people, it's talking about Jacob, Israel, his beloved, and if you're in Jesus today, if you've surrendered to Jesus and you've Given your life over to him, you're full of the spirit, you are grafted into the vine. Okay, so this applies to you. It says, God found him in a desert land, and in the howling waste of a wilderness, he encircled him, he cared for him, he guarded him as the pupil of his eye. This is God's heart towards you. This is God's intention towards you. Regardless of your experience, this is eternal. Okay, how do you guard the pupil of your eye? You have some amazing reflexes where, you know, something's coming at you and your eyelids will do the thing and shut down. But most of us, if you don't have the, the fruit ninja sword, right, it's a, you put your hands up. However, you, you respond to guard the pupil of your eye, okay? You need to remember, this is how God guards you. If you are in Jesus, he has committed himself to guard you like somebody with amazing reflexes, strength, and speed guards the pupil of their eye. So I want you to remember with this Fruit Ninja analogy, God is playing Fruit Ninja for you. Okay, he's signed up, he's got, he's got the controller, he's like, get your hands off, I'm faster than you and you know it. You know, he is playing Fruit Ninja for the protection of your soul, the protection of your heart. This is the scriptural case I'm making for you. He sets himself up to do it. Let's keep looking. Isaiah 26, verse three. The steadfast of mind or heart, you will keep in perfect peace. You will keep, you will guard in perfect peace because he trusts in you. When you have a steadfastness of mind that Jesus Christ, the rock, can give you, the Lord keeps in perfect peace the one whose mind is stayed on himself. If you got the the notes on your way in or you can get them on your way out, I've got another list of, of verses where guard is used in this context wherein the Lord presents himself as the guardian of your heart, so I encourage you to check that out if you need that as a resource and a list of reminders. Okay, so I wanna transition. We're talking about heart and guard, and then this is kind of part of the point of my message. I just really wanted to apply Proverbs 4.23 to 
to this, but I want to talk for just a little bit about strongholds. It's in the last few minutes that we're talking about. So, so God is our refuge. He is our guard, right? Above all else, guard your heart by pressing into the God who is your guardian. That's my thesis, but I want to talk about strongholds. So the word presents, the word of God presents the Lord himself as a stronghold for us. What's a stronghold? It's not a common American English word. It's like a castle. It's like a tower of defense. It's a place of safety. Like, you know, the, the, the bad guy army is coming. We are members of the kingdom. We can come out from our fields and come into the keep, the castle, the fortress, the stronghold. Okay, so God sets himself up in, as his name is our stronghold. Okay, so let's set up for the Lord is my only stronghold. That's what I titled this message, the Lord my only stronghold. Let's see where we get kind of that reference. Second Samuel 22, 3, it says, David, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior, you save me from violence. So God sets himself up as the stronghold for us. God is to be the only stronghold, the only place we run to for shelter and for safety and for care and for feeding and for healing and all the stuff that we're supposed to find in him. But I just, you know, if we get real, a lot of us have other strongholds, maybe sinful strongholds, places outside the the set, you know, Here's the, here's the walls of God's stronghold of his design of this is where you're supposed to be in life. This is the way you're supposed to live your life because God says, I know you and I know what's good for you and I know how you can live your best life. Please stay with me, right? But when we doubt him, we, we believe a lie about him or whatever, a lot of us go source somewhere else. We self-medicate, right? We self-protect like I was talking about with the guard your heart misinterpretation, okay? And I've, I've been there. I've been delivered from so much but we need to make the Lord the only stronghold. Like in counseling ministry right now, as of last June, I became the pastor of prayer ministry here in fear and trembling. I inherited the Jihop, and I'm loving it. I've got a great lead team, but I interact a lot with our pastor of counseling, James Bedwell, and his volunteers are amazing. Um, and I've, I've gone through a bunch of Christian counseling myself, been delivered from a bunch of trash that I was going to because it made me feel powerful or it comforted me. I mean, suicide like threats of, of death and self-hatred, lots of anger. Like I, I haven't been kicked out of a small group here at Grace in more than 20 years, but 20 or 30 years ago, Darcy's laughing because she and my parents know, I mean, I had overwhelming anger as a kid that I would go to because I felt so powerless. And so, hey, anger gives me power, let's go. You know, different pornography and lust, different addictions, addiction to food, addiction to alcohol, some of, some of us. It's like, these are places where when we can't control our lives or we feel like we need to source something, we go there. And the kind of counseling Christian ministry term for that is also a stronghold. But it's the wrong one, it's a sinful stronghold. I heard a pastor define a stronghold in that sense, a sinful stronghold, as a place where the devil feels comfortable in your life. The Lord is presented as our stronghold, but sometimes we have these places where we go to for comfort and there the devil feels comfortable. So if you're in Jesus, he's Lord of your life, his spirit is in you, like the house of your life, the Bible talks about the, the picture of a, a house, a temple of the Holy Spirit, whatever, but I firmly believe that there are sometimes rooms, maybe that dusty broom closet over there that you don't let Jesus into, right? Because of shame, because of fear, whatever, keeps, keeps Jesus out of that part of your life, that area of your life, of your, your choices and your decisions. But the devil's in there. He's got his lazy boy set up, and anytime you want to come to him, you come get you know you come get your get your get your alcohol, get your food addiction, get your sexual addiction, get your substance abuse, get you know even if it's just comforting yourself with anger because you feel out of control, like I used to so many times. And again, I'm not walking perfect from these guys. I'm not from a like I'm in heaven now, delivered place. Yeah, my mom's laughing. It's good, um, but the Lord has set me free, and the devil is no longer comfortable in these places in my life because Jesus Christ is enough. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. We had this sweet Olive Garden waitress on Friday night, Emma and I got a timeout, and there was, oh, we got a timeout, it was amazing. 
<laughs> but it, the kids need a timeout. The parents need a timeout. I have an almost two-year-old. And the, the waitress, her name was Michelle, and she's like, and we, Emma offered to pray for her and just said, we're people of Jesus. We love to pray for people. And Michelle's like, oh, okay. I, I love that. Yeah, I struggle. Like, so is your, do you find it makes a difference? Is it, is it better? You know, she was just this innocent, just open. I, like, I feel really lost. I don't know. I'm kind of going to school. I don't know what I'm doing next. Do you, do you find, is it better? Does it make a difference? And we're like, oh, baby. <laughs> you have no idea what Jesus has delivered us from. Yes, it's better. Come, come find him to be your stronghold. So that's my encouragement for y'all. Some of us do need professional help like I've gotten with Christian counseling. You've got you know, the amazing James Bedwell and his team here, or you just need to plug in at the Grace House of Prayer and just spend more time in the presence of God and make the devil uncomfortable yourself. It's going to be great. But do it. Make the Lord your stronghold and your only place of refuge. It's so much better. And this is how we do it. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. Let's get context for how we war against this trash. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. That's how we do it. If there's a place where the evil one is comfortable in your life, there is freedom for you. Make the Lord your stronghold. And again, why are we studying this? Let's look one more time. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So how do we respond to the word? Praise God. Here, here in America, we preach the word a lot, maybe, but sometimes a lot of us struggle with the, with the application. The Lord's given me three ways that I think a lot of you may need to respond. Uh, first, and this is something I've been reconvicted of lately, is just really, really prioritizing daily time connecting with the Lord. In his word, in worship, and in prayer, like, you know, I've, I've connected with the Lord every day. I've made that commitment. You know, my pastor, Joey, needs to do this. But, like, in baby world, y'all, the last two years have been nuts. The last two years have been nuts. And for Josiah's first year, praise God, somehow I found the strength. I was still up at five trying to get up before him, you know, six feedings a night or whatever. And saw at the Lord, but I burned out in January. <laughs> I was just like, I'm going to spend time with my baby on my lap, and he will sleep, and I will Read the, read the word of the Lord and I will pray. You know, I, I had to combine them, but I've gotten back to this place where if I don't get up between 4 and 6 a.m., I don't get time with the Lord. So right now, the Lord's brought me back to this place where I get up between 4 and 6. I'm not bragging. It's just the strength of the Lord and how hungry I am. I get up between 4 and 6 a.m. seven days a week. If I'm going to get time with the Lord, then maybe I'll get a nap and it's great. I'd live in naps. Naps are great. Um, but I got to, hallelujah, I'm telling you. And my sweet wife, she gave me a nap yesterday. It was great. Um, glory. But, Get that time with the Lord because I'm a much better person to be around if I've got that. Anybody, amen? You know, every spouse in the room, amen? You know, just, oh my gosh, y'all. I'm such a better person. So I encourage you, if you find the devil is comfortable in your life, spending time with the Lord in passionate prayer and soaking in the word, soaking in your favorite worship music, coming into the grace house of prayer, that's gonna make the enemy uncomfortable and it's gonna be great. Second thing, I just as we look at this era, this season, I, I really firmly believe this generation's gonna see BC is before corona, and CE is the corona era. I think we've hit like that, that, that hinge on the timeline. One of my baby's first words was mask, God bless us. Um, like, really, the top 10 is like mama, dada, milk, mask, you know, oh, it hurts. But I genuinely believe we're at a, we're at a turning point and what came with so much of this, the isolation in the last trash couple of years, just the, the people just being separated for fear's sake, for some science sake, I'm not gonna judge. So much depression and anxiety and fear and different just mental illnesses and stuff that happens when people get alone has crept in. And again, as the pastor of prayer ministry here, I'm all about eradicating that trash. So like, Get with people. There's a great opportunity. 5.30 today, come to the Together Again dinner, potluck, hang out, connect with human beings in a room. Do it safe. You need to wear a mask, whatever precautions you need to do. But whatever level you can interact with human beings in a room, seeking Jesus, laughing together, do it. Ministry fair on the 8th, like Mike Lopez said. He was just sitting out in there in, in the audience, you know, whatever, and 
he said, we found out ways to serve, and life is better now. And I love Mike Lopez. He's so full of joy. He presents so well. And the third thing I'd encourage you all to as I wrap up is come to Discovering Jihop here in a, about a month. If you struggle, if I'm talking about spend time with Jesus, get your daily prayer on, you know, if you struggle, how do I keep prayer interesting? What does the church really believe about prophecy and healing and, and spending time with the Lord? Come to Discovering Jihop. Spend more time in the Grace House of Prayer and connect with, with me and with others that are like-minded that really want to seek the Lord and make him the stronghold of your life. Okay, I want to close with the congregational reading. We don't always just read a verse together, so if you're physically able, would you stand with me? We're going to read Psalm 27, 1 again. I know it's close to lunch. He's almost done. Yes. I'm going to read Psalm 27, 1, and let's read this with the passion of all the verses we just went through of God's character. Okay, I read this with the power of this is the God that I'm talking about. This is the God who can come through for me. And just declare this as truth over your life. Okay, let's do this with passion. I know I got theater people in the room. Let's act like theater people. Okay, Psalm 27, verse 1. Let's go all together now. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? 